our mandate is to work with the field and all of the great individuals, stakeholders, parents, teachers, policymakers, researchers, and others who are working with students with disabilities. Our goal is to provide up-to-date resources and materials and technical assistance to help inform and guide the work of the field. So again, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Rose. He is familiar to many of you, if not all of you on the phone, as the co-founder of CAF, which was started in 1984 under David's direction and vision to create a nonprofit center that was focused on both the research and to better understand the application of technology to work with a whole variety of learners and their needs. As a result of the work of CAF, the field of Universal Design for Learning, or UDL, has really become a cornerstone of education, both educational policy and also education and teaching and learning so that teachers around the country are working to integrate the important principles of UDL in their teaching. Uh, David, for the last almost 30 years, who's counting, has also been a professor at the Harvard School of Education, where he has touched the lives of thousands of students over the last three decades. And I must say, uh, of all of David's enormous accomplishments in terms of his publications, his books, and other articles, uh, one of the things that uh, I think exemplifies his outstanding work is that he was selected as one of the daring dozen by Edutopia magazine uh, in terms of highlighting his important contribution to the field of education, psychology, and teaching and learning. So on that note, it gives me great pleasure to hand the slides over to David, who's going to walk us through uh, the critical issues facing students with special needs as they venture into this whole world of online learning. David, take it away. Hi, thanks very much, Tracy. Um, and uh, I look forward to uh, uh, spending a little time talking about this topic that uh, uh, has occupied a number of us here at, at the center. And uh, so let me just uh, show you who's uh, involved in the Center uh, on Online Learning and Students with Disabilities. Um, uh, I think most of you know that Don Deschler has just recently retired, but he was the principal PI at the beginning of this center. Um, CAST is involved, and uh, they're the names of uh, some of the people here. And uh, the NASDI, the National Association of State Directors of Special Education, um, is the third partner. And we've been working together now for um, uh, th three-ish years. Uh, and this, um, as the first slide said, uh, rapidly changing uh, world. Uh, in fact, I wanted to start there. I think some of you may be familiar. Um, oh, by the way, uh, there'll be uh, Elise is going to monitor the um, chat. So if people have questions, things that I'm not clear about, or I should say more or less about, uh, feel free to type something in. I'm not going to monitor it visually, but uh, uh, Elise will, and she'll um, interrupt me if uh, there's something that uh, we should all talk about. And I'd be happy to be interrupted. Um, uh, it's hard, as you know, all of you know, I'm sure, to speak into this uh, faceless uh, medium. So uh, a little interruption would be a good thing. Um, so uh, some of you are familiar with uh, Stephen Jay Gould, probably a um, very prominent paleontologist. Uh, at uh, taught evolutionary biology at Harvard, and uh, many um, 
important books and so on. And um, uh, I've highlighted uh, um, uh, two of them here because they're so different. Uh, one is his uh, textbooky tome on uh, uh, the structure of evolutionary theory. He could do that. And another one of his more popular books, um, The Triumph and Tragedy in Mudville, was about baseball. Uh, he was not only a legendary paleontologist, but a legendary baseball fan. And uh, he wrote articles about how baseball evolved that are um, among the most, uh, what should I say, certainly the most uh, evolutionary biological look at uh, baseball. Anyway, all of his work um, emphasizes one aspect of the evolution of everything, which is that at the beginning of things, things are um, highly variable, a lot of chaotic uh, variability in anything. And you have much more extremes. Uh, and as anything grows and develops, it stabilizes and has smaller deviations, smaller variability. And, uh, the means make uh, it's easier to describe things with their means. Um, but so baseball, the one article he's famous for is talking about why there'll never be another 400 hitter in baseball, and it's uh, because baseball has evolved such that now um, uh, what used to be highly variable in terms of people's skills meant that there were people who were batting 100 and people who were batting 400 in the same league. And now that almost never occurs, and certainly not at the professional level. Everybody pretty much bats at about 275 now, and a few outliers, but outliers only go into the low 300s even, um, because the pitchers are all good now, and the hitters are all good, and it's stabilized around a much smaller range. Um, so his argument is we'll never see another 400 hitter. Um, so the field of online learning is definitely a new field. And it is marked by great variability, uh, enormous variability in uh, every aspect. And so when we first began to look at on the way was, oh my god, it is so, uh, so highly variable in what anybody even means by online learning, what people do in online learning, what kind of students are in online learning, everything's variables. So that's the main thing that I want to say today, and I'm going to say it in a number of ways, a uh, number of topics, um, 10 specifically, um, 10 general findings that we have, um, all of which are um, notable for their huge variance now. Over time, this field will uh, stabilize and things will become much more alike. It's like now pretty much every car looks alike. I think you all have that experience. It used to be the cars were really different. And uh, now, you know, they all look just about the same. I don't know how Cadillacs even differentiate themselves anymore. Okay, so 10 topics. Um, and uh, the first is that in general, there's this large variance of everything and small central tendencies around what really happens. Um, and other than the inclusion of some kind of online content delivery, there's really no consistent or uniform procedures that constitute the practice of online learning. So the closer you look at it, the less it looks like there's a thing there called online learning. There's a whole bunch of different things, uh, much more like furniture, where there's all kinds of different things in it. Um, than like uh, stoves, where there's um, considerable sameness about them. So um, here's some of the sources of variance. When you look at any online vendor, uh, and this would include blended or uh, completely virtual, uh, you'll see that the populations of students with disabilities is a huge variance, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, um, in how many kids with disabilities will be in any uh, instantiation. The roles that are played by teachers and parents will differ widely among the different uh, varieties of online learning. 
the quality of the instructional design. Does it have anything that looks like evidence-based practices or not? Huge variation. Um, from our standpoint, basic accessibility, universal design features, huge variation there as well. Some have near zero accessibility, which is a bad start, um, and some are really quite good. Uh, just a few more to give uh, this range. Um, whether students can uh, have peer-to-peer -peer relationships within the online environment or do they interact much with teachers is highly variable. Um, how teachers and administrators are trained and what kind of resources they're given to get them ready is extremely variable. The ways in which monitoring progress is accomplished or not accomplished, highly variable. Um, how teachers, students, um, parents, anybody gets feedback is incredibly different among the different instantiations. And the requirements for what you need offline to support kids, particularly with disabilities, um, is uh, another area where there's uh, great, great variation. I'm going to elaborate on uh, a few of these. Um, and I'll, I have a bunch of topics that I've got these little semicolons. I think Tracy knows I don't really know how to use semicolons, so it might be a different thing would be better there. But anyway, data rich, information poor. Um, one of the things that's notable is that there's enormous amounts of data, just striking compared to the traditional kinds of data in face-to-face -face classrooms. Um, and uh, the reality, however, is that the way the environment is now, that the lack of communication and interoperability across various systems, we'll talk a little bit about it, currently makes the tracking that one would want to be able to do with that data nearly impossible. So we have huge amounts of data, but very little information that's usable by a parent or a teacher or a student to help them uh, either design or uh, actualize a path through materials. So lots of data, but not much information. Um, this is a, just a uh, we worked with one provider to really try to get a feeling of how the information flow uh, operates within the provider. So that blue box is the actual provider, the person that, uh, the vendor that you would recognize if I were telling you. Um, and it has all of these elements in it some of which they made, some of which they bought, some of which they licensed, all of them, blah, blah. And uh, everything from how does a course get in there to how does um, uh, assessment happen to uh, what kinds of third-party environments of all kinds happen and so on. But these things all don't necessarily talk well to each other. So there's not even good data flows within um, a lot of vendors that they have all these moving pieces, and sometimes there are firewalls uh, between these pieces, and sometimes there's just interoperability problems between the pieces. So sometimes they really don't have any idea um, that these pieces don't talk to each other in ways that would help students. And it's a, a problem not all vendors, but a lot of vendors have, because um, they've been cobbled together. They put in a lot of things together to make this work fast. It's a problem of... Uh, you know, the field being early. Um, and here's just some summaries. Uh, the vendors um, are hobbled by this. They have lots of big data um, that, uh, that they potentially could use, but too little information from the schools about the individual students with disabilities, they, their strengths and weaknesses, their IEP goals, um, any of those things. Vendors typically don't get much of that information, and you'd think they would, but as we'll see, privacy concerns actually uh, erect barriers here. So the vendors would like to do a better job, uh, and they could do a better job if they knew more about the students, but they actually don't get that information in a timely fashion often. So they are often feel like they're been um, blinded, excuse the expression, by um, uh, data that is sitting there close by but is not providing them the information they need. 
they, I think most mentors would like to do a better job. They'd like to know more about the students. School is the same thing. Um, the, they could use this fabulous amount of data that the vendors are picking up. The vendors are often getting every click a kid does. It's kind of extraordinary. Um, so they can know everything, not just whether the kid passed tests or stuff, but they can know what kind of help did they ask for, what are they communicating about, what did they do after they made a mistake, uh, what did they do after uh, they took a vacation. Uh, all of this stuff is available in the vendor's uh, data, but it's not, uh, not routinely shared with schools, and schools often can't get it for some of the same um, reasons. Uh, it's lots of concerns about, well, who owns this data? Can the vendor really share it um, with schools? And are the schools really ready to gather in this data and use it? And often they're not. It's because uh, it comes in a form that schools aren't ready to look at and that uses identifiers and things that make it complicated for schools. So schools are faced with this all this rich data um, that is minute by minute what their students are doing, but they actually often don't know it, don't get that information. They just get either d data that they don't know what to do with or they don't get any data. And lastly, parents and students themselves. Um, for them to make good choices, the same problems obtain. That is, they, even though the data is there, they don't get the information often that they would like or need often because they don't know what that information is, um, but often because it's not shared uh, among these three parties. So this is a sad uh, factor of being early in a field. Uh, all the parts are not working well together. And David, um, let me just jump in here for one second. Uh, just to note that Andy is, based on his experience, corroborating what you're saying about this whole issue of the data that supposedly is available for teachers in particular, but it's often very siloed. And that uh, from Andy's experience, he only had information on his own students, but also issues of IEPs and privacy uh, also uh, have an impact on who gets the data and how it can be used. So thanks, Andy. Great. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Uh, so you've been there. I can see that. Um, and it's, so what's hard is there's great opportunity in here, and we're not realizing it yet. And through, you know, it's not like there's blame to be uh, assigned. Um, privacy is an important issue. But right now, it's a barrier to actually doing the kind of individualizing instruction that we'd really like to be able to do. And we'll talk about this later when we get to policies. Um, so a third topic. Um, old methods in new packaging. Um, the majority of online instructional offerings, uh, as we look at them, are mostly traditional offline materials delivered online. And you've heard this before, largely um, electronic workbooks, um, page turning and answering questions. Um, and the online world has some benefits. There's things they can do that make that better. but they don't change it in a, a substantial way. It's just a new delivery mechanism for our old methods. Um, and less common are, I have here curricular offerings, but it's probably instructional um, processes that uh, would take advantage of the unique affordances of online learning. So um, we see less than we would like or you would like of uh, really taking advantage of what getting like crazy on all kinds of devices, um, but a lot of the online um, environments really kind of uh, um, are uh, divorced from that, so the kids actually don't communicate with each other. Um, and uh, one that we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, Actually, the the new um, the new power one of the new powers here is to really support students um, in learning to self-regulate their own learning because there's more opportunities for kids to take um, autonomy uh, to uh, build uh, independence 
Um, but that would take kind of a design that really fosters that and supports it and stuff. And lots of the online uh, providers don't really have that. So the kids are kind of left on their own to self-regulate often, and that doesn't work very well. Um, one of the great, of course, powers of the, these new technologies is that you can really differentiate instruction. And enough variability there to allow kids to take very different pathways. Um, and there's not enough advantage taken of that yet. Um, we can, the new uh, technologies would allow kids to demonstrate what they've learned in lots of different ways, but most of them are pretty much uh, multiple choice answering questions, um, student-centered learning, so on. There's lots of um, uh, new capabilities that the online world can provide uh, that are being taken advantage of only, um, what should I say, only beginning to be taken advantage of. When you look across the whole spectrum of online learning, it looks pretty traditional. There are great innovators, so I should be careful. Remember that behind every one of these great variants, we'll see really interesting things happening and lots of really boring things, too. Um, the, a sub-point of this is that the majority of online uh, providers are still uh, focused on content. Um, and kids with disabilities are uh, especially needy of um, process development, learning such things as self-regulation, strategies, uh, uh, how to uh, manage their time, how to have um, how to build executive function, how to socialize better, how to know when to get help, all of those things. Um, and um, mostly what you see when you look at online learning is content mastery. Just did you, we showed you a bunch of things to read, did you, were, did you gather that in in such a way that you can answer questions? Um, so again, a kind of uh, conservative early stage in online development. Uh, the, another aspect that we'll come to again is this, in, we have this enormous data capability with um, automatized analytics to really do uh, rich personalization and really monitor students, not just right and wrong answers, but uh, how much are they uh, doing, how much chances are they taking, how much help are they wanting, how much all sorts of things. Um, what's their academic health? Um, we have ways to measure that um, that are uh, just completely unusual compared to traditional brick and mortar schools. Um, and there's great variance. Some companies are doing pretty good at it and some companies, um, there's almost none of that. Um, fourth topic, um, design. Uh, design matters a lot um, and there's enormous variation uh, both uh, between and within vendors, um, just meaning basic accessibility. Now, one thing to highlight here, because it makes it really hard for us to do our work, but also for a parent or a teacher to make good decisions, because a, a single vendor may have uh, courses, for example, that were made by very different people using very different technologies. And so you may have one course within the same vendor, let's call them, uh, you know, uh, Superman's learning objects or something. Uh, one part of it may be very accessible to kids with disabilities. And then another part, which looks the same, um, same uh, vendor, will be completely inaccessible. So even within the same vendor, same company, there's huge variation, which makes it, um, as a center, we thought we'd be able to highlight, well, here's some vendors that do a really good job, here's some vendors that really do a bad job, and be able to provide for consumers good information about that. But actually, it's much more complicated than that. Within a single vendor, we'd have to go, and sometimes it's down to single pages. They're going along pretty well, and all of a sudden, they'll have a page that's completely inaccessible. But, of course, that's terminally important to a kid with disability to get somewhere, and all of a sudden, you're at somewhere you can't do anything. Um, so the variance within uh, as 
almost as big as the variance between vendors, a huge problem. Um, and uh, beyond sheer access, um, UDL has been um, adopted in various ways by a number of vendors, uh, some very strongly and some uh, very weakly. Some, I'm sure, have never heard about UDL. Um, and uh, so variation exists in whether they go beyond access to design in uh, the kind of learning supports that a wide variety of kids with disabilities would need. I've already mentioned, for example, building in supports so kids can, um, uh, for kids with executive function disabilities, so that they can, in fact, um, be able to uh, be somewhat independent but have the supports they would need to do that well. Uh, when you look at a vendor, um, this is sort of at the low end. This is what you can see out of uh, um, part of the center's work. We developed a UDL scan tool. And this is just looking at the, does this vendor provide multiple means of representation? And um, there was 36. 36 would be a top score. And you can see that, in fact, um, uh, they do some things, but it's really kind of uh, very meager in this case. Um, uh, here we are just entirely around perception. Um, is, uh, sometimes the whole thing is completely imperceptible uh, to people with, uh, who are blind, for example. Um, so we'll have big variations. Some do a, we actually have also seen several that do a very good job. They've really uh, stuck to the web accessibility guidelines and um, have an institutional policy of trying to make their stuff accessible. OK, new topic. Um, context really matters in, I think, more than we expected. Um, I think it first came to us with a very, uh, what you'd have to call rigid, um, online provider that really kind of locked into what you should do. And yet, when we were able to get some data, what you find out is that it works really well in some state or district and really not well in another. And yet it's exactly the same. The technology is exactly the same. What the vendor's providing is exactly the same. And you see this huge variance between different locations. And uh, when you look at that data, you're really struck by how could that be? It's like, actually, I was going to say it's like medicine. And it is like medicine, actually. If you give, um, if you give me um, certain drugs that are really good for Sally, uh, they're poisonous to me, as it turns out, because I'm allergic to them. And it turns out that it's that kind of variant. You'll see, this really works in Idaho. It doesn't work at all in Boston. And it sometimes it'll, if you get close to the data, you find out it works in some classrooms and not in others in the same school. And of course, that has to do with what are the teachers doing? What is the community doing? How has this been set up? What is the technology that's available? What is the, um, what's the orientation and motivation about schooling in general here and so on? All of these have huge effects, which is reassuring as an educator, I think. There's not a magic bullet here. It's not like this stuff really always works. It doesn't work. It really depends on uh, the soil in which it's going to be planted. Um, and this just slide just is kind of a reminder that because um, you'll hear about blended learning. And what's blended learning? I, I, I don't think we think there's, there's very few things that are not blended uh, now. That uh, It's only a few completely virtual. Um, instantiation of online learning. Most of them are blended in some way. But the blends are really quite different. Um, some, I just want to highlight that there are things that are uh, natively offline that are often done as part of an online delivery. Kids read a book or watch a video, but that may be uh, offline completely. Um, there are things that are natively offline and that are delivered now online, which is, again, like I said, not really change anything, just taking the textbook Put it online, and you click through it. Watching a video online, is that online or not? Is it really any different than watching a video in your classroom? And then there are some things that are natively online, things that you couldn't actually do except online. 
having a group project that's measuring the salinity of all of the rivers and streams all across the country and all the students gathering the data and analyzing the data and doing experiments. You can't do that offline. It's natively online. And um, we're finding that there's an increasing but still beginning use of the things that are really natively online. Oh, this is getting at the power of what an online networked environment could really do for kids that is different than what can be done in a single classroom. Um, all of that variation, that is between how much is offline, how much is online, how much use is real online, is big variance. But then you have the variance of what happens uh, locally. And uh, this, these are real numbers, student ratios. How, how many kids are there that are under the supervision or mentoring of a single teacher? And um, it's, like everything else I've been seeing so far, huge variation. Um, where sometimes a single teacher will have 200 kids um, that are their students. And uh, sometimes it'll be very small. Um, and by the way, this can sometimes happen. We've seen instantiations where uh, a single teacher can have uh, 25 to 50 kids with special needs all as their uh, students. And uh, I don't think anybody out there thinks well, that wouldn't matter what the ratio is. The ratios, the ratios are gigantically different. Um, in some cases, um, the variance of what you do with kids with disabilities, if the vendor actually knows, if the school is shared who has student disabilities, is just like in brick and mortar schools, highly varied. Sometimes special needs kids get special things. Sometimes they're just in with sort of everything that everybody else does, but that's a source of variance. The number of contacts per week or month, highly variable. Uh, some kids in virtual environments have personal contact, which would be by phone or online, uh, once a week or once a month total. And some have it almost every day, huge variance. Um, who's responsible for something like an IEP? Um, there's great variation in whether the school retains that responsibility where the vendor uh, takes up some or all of that responsibility. And some of the worst case scenarios where the school has done a full IEP and can't share it with the vendor, so the vendor has to redo uh, essentially an IEP. And they can't get the kids going on their learning because they have to do a whole new assessment because they can't get it from the school. And I will say, by the way, I, I hope I'm not sounding uh, um, putting down of either of those partners because they, they both have uh, equipment problems. We've seen cases where the school wouldn't share the IEP with the vendor, not because of policies, but because um, they were uh, ticked off that there was online learning in their school and they, didn't, they just wanted to make the, the job of the vendor harder. Um, so uh, there's... Uh, solicit parents directly and say, well, your kid doesn't need an IEP in our system because all of the learning is individualized. But for the reasons I've already showed you, sometimes the material is completely inaccessible. There's no teacher that's involved anywhere near enough to um, individualize. There's no executive support and so on. So um, that's where sometimes, and this would only be some vendors, some vendors essentially are circumventing all of the um, uh, the protections that have built up for kids with disabilities and saying, yeah, don't worry about an IMP. And so we have that variance. That's what is the field is like. Some vendors would are desperate to get the IEP so they can do a good job. And some vendors are saying, eh, don't worry about an IEP. It's all automatic, which is not the case. Um, even who's the primary teacher, um, as uh, I think I'll show in another slide, in some cases, the parent becomes much more the primary teacher than we ever expected. Um, uh, so, summary of this. The context is so varied that uh, it has strong effects on outcomes. Um, and uh, one can't study, for example, is online vendor 
X. Um, it, it's almost impossible to say it works. You almost, like other things in our field, you'd have to say it works for whom and where and when. Um, they almost, uh, it's almost impossible to think about them working in the abstract where vendor A is always good. Uh, rarely happens. Um, sixth point, um, just checking in. Um, oh, we had some. We had some technical difficulties, uh, David, but uh, it looks like everybody's back, uh, can hear, so you're doing just fine. Okay, uh, did I say anything interesting during that time they were off, uh, Tracy? You, you did, but we will be able to post the slides so that people will get to see what they, oh, okay, they could good. see that they could see they just couldn't hear, David. Okay, well, that seems the best part. Um, uh, so, sixth issue. Um, uh, it's, uh, sorry, the continuation of the sixth, which is just about teacher preparation. Um, we uh, looked at um, what's the difference if you're a teacher online or offline. And uh, all of the stakeholders reported that teaching online is really different. Here's a list of all the things. I'm going to skip this for now, but it's, it's really quite different. It's not the same at all. You don't get to see the student. You can't tell they're looking depressed. You don't know that their um, parents divorced last night or any of that. It's really, you're in a completely different environment um, and materials are different and so on. Um, but few teachers are being prepared professionally for this difference. Uh, very few teacher preparation programs, you think of all the teacher preparation programs you went to, they probably still don't teach. Um, they don't give internships or practice teaching or anything in the online world. And yet a lot of people are now uh, teaching in this online world, but they're not being very well prepared. The vendors often provide uh, in-surface uh, teaching for teachers. Um, but often it's hard to get time to do that well enough uh, and so on. Sometimes schools provide it, but it, again, is a source of huge variance. And some teachers are well-trained, and a lot of teachers are not at all well-trained in this whole new medium. Um, national survey, uh, I don't, you know, there's the authors. Uh, less than 2% of teacher preparation programs offer field experience in online learning. So people are not being prepared for this um, and so on. There's all sorts of early stage problems here in teacher development. Parent preparation, um, I mentioned it briefly, but we certainly have seen instantiations, the ones that are more virtual, where parents are playing uh, really um, the critical role as teachers. Um, the kids are at home and under the parent supervision and there's only occasional uh, interaction with live teachers, again, via phone or um, email or something. Um, and, uh, and we see the opposite, too, where uh, parents have no, uh, no knowledge of how their kids are doing online or don't uh, know anything about it, don't see it. Uh, so we have the, like the other topics I've had, this variance between online learning in one case where the parent is essentially really a, a provider and the major teacher and other instantiation where the parent really can't even get information, doesn't even know what's happening. Um, so the variance is hard on parents. And for par parents like teachers will report that they're not really prepared for this. They, they would need more. They often don't know what they should do, what they shouldn't do. We've seen, we did a little case study work where we could see uh, go into the homes and see parents working with their kids um, to see what really happens and huge variance. Some parents, truthfully, are filling in the blanks for their kids. Um, you know, so they want their kids to get a good score on the end of unit test and so the parents are kind of doing it. Um, uh, I think Tracy would have done that actually. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, some, and some parents, uh, we found a case where one parent who was supposedly helping their kid and supporting them and so on was actually running a, a family daycare in another room and was almost never there for their kids. So huge variance again. Um, the biggest, and I'm, I, I'm getting near the end of this, so you, just so you know, um, on the context issues, um, 
the biggest one uh, from our work so far has been policy differences. Um, every stakeholder in the ecosystem, from parents to schools to vendors, complained about the problems that um, very inconsistent and anachronistic policies um, get in the way of anybody doing a good job. Um, that means the vendor feels like we could do a better job if the policies would allow us to do that. And those policies may be state policies, they may be district policies, they might even be a single teacher's policy that she, you know, a teacher might have a policy. I never let the kids have text-to-speech or something. That's a policy. Um, and yet that kid actually needs that and the vendor provides it, but the parent won't let the kid use it or whatever. Um, and uh, all kinds of, uh, we talked about privacy being a big issue um, where everybody would like more data to transfer between these parts and policies really get in the way. Uh, so policies are, if anything, the big uh, challenge here. Uh, and I'm not sure we thought that when we got into this work. And uh, at the end of the talk, I want to talk about, uh, we want to actually go after the policy arena because it's such a dominating effect. Um, here's some suggestions. I think I'll uh, skip these for the moment, just of, um, that there are increasing attention to laws that would protect students. I think you know that, that would protect their privacy, which is very important. Um, California here's a, uh, has a very new policy which really stipulates strongly um, uh, protections so that student um, information can't be sold and uh, licensed or given away to um, other people, especially uh, um, corporations wishing to sell to them or whatever. And those are really good and necessary things. Um, What's the challenge is how do, you can't do a good job as an online provider unless you do have information about the kid. And you can't, as a school system, evaluate whether the online provider is doing a good job unless you have information tagged to your specific students. Is this vendor's program working for my autistic kids is a central question. Is it working for my kids with dyslexia is a central question. And to know answers to those questions, we have to share data. Um, and that's one of the challenges that's big out there. At the center, we've been running a state policies table, so you can look at different states and see what their policies are. Um, and they're changing rapidly, as we'll see. Um, here's the kinds of policies that are there. All, every, policies affect almost everything, whether you've got to be prepared as a teacher, what kind of accommodations are necessary, um, uh, what kind of, how can funding be used, can you give a bonus, for kids with disabilities to a vendor, et cetera, all kinds of uh, policies. Um, and we looked at the policies as they're changing a little bit between like 2013, 2014. I think, uh, I don't want to go through these all. You can look at these slides later. Um, but here's uh, to give a sense of how the policy people in a state, um, how do they feel? What do they know? And uh, 2000. 13, 2014 weren't really very different at state levels um, in terms of, do they even know how many students with disabilities are in online learning? And you can see that most of them feel they're not very knowledgeable about that, which is, you know, a pretty basic thing. Are, do you have a lot of kids with disabilities taking online courses or only a few? And actually, uh, state heads, these would be state directors of special education, they don't even know that, can't get it, because the data just doesn't work right now. So they don't know whether, you, you see, you know, the largest majority say they're not knowledgeable. I don't know, which is kind of amazing, because the data's there. Um, and if we ask, how comfortable are you with your policies? Um, most people are uncomfortable with their own policies. They can see that this is not working. Uh, so the, the majority of people say, we're not comfortable. And a large number say, we're not at all comfortable. Um, OK, that's one slide got in there by mistake. Um, and uh, we asked them, uh, again, state directors, um, how confident do you, your teachers and administrators know how to deliver 
um, in these online worlds, kids with disabilities. You can see this. 80% say, I'm not comfortable, meaning I don't think teachers are prepared to do this. So again, here's a, this is worrisome that um, the people who um, direct uh, special education uh, don't feel that they're ready to do it yet. Now again, huge variance. You'll find a pocket, a school, a district where it's great, and you'll find uh, others where it's not great at all. People are doing it that don't have really much training and don't know, uh, and don't know how to adapt to kids with disabilities and so on. Um, uh, a question that you'd love to think was easy for us to get the answer to is um, the, just the simple question, how many kids with autism are doing this? How many kids with physical disabilities are doing that? Um, and as I said, that's very actually hard to get because of this discontinuities between the data sources. Um, there's a few things that are uh, just highlighted here. You can see this difference. When we looked at different vendor school partnerships, we could find some partnerships where only 3% of the kids enrolled would be kids with disabilities. Another partnership had 35% of the kids enrolled were kids with disabilities. We've heard that it's as high as 60% in some places where there's vendors who are preferentially going after kids with disabilities. Um, uh, so a difference between 3% and 35% is pretty huge, um, uh, pretty variable. Uh, here you see the stats on why do families choose an online uh, environment in school, um, and a lot of them uh, I have to say the more vibrant ones that come out are, aren't so, not just big numbers, but uh, particular, oh, this is where you, you can see how problematic it is. For some kinds of disabilities, the child being bullying is the majority reason to have your kid go online. Uh, for some, it's a minor thing, but for some kinds of kids, kids um, with social disabilities, um, the, uh, it's very prominent for parents to say, I wanted him out of traditional school because he's being bullied. Uh, and uh, I have an, someone here, uh, Janet's pointing out that Andy said something. Uh, I had yes, several uh, Andy, Andy was corroborating. He was talking about his work with autistic students who actually thrived in online environments due to the low social interaction and the highly structured nature of the learning environment. And then Alice chimed in that she worked at an AT center where they used several online packages uh, for reading and literacy, but she notes that they were coupled with individual instruction. So, yeah. the, so the students had access to that traditional face-to-face -face individual instruction. And that's a key part of the variance. Some schools provide that, and some don't. So whether the online's going to work um, depends, I think Alice is saying, on you getting that individualized instruction offline. And yes. But I want to go back to Andy's point, because it's critical. Um, here's the issue. There are that we don't know good enough answers to there are kids that are being pulled out of um, traditional brick and mortar schools and put online because they're behavior problems. They have social problems. Some of them are kids with autism. And both school and parents will report things are better because they have fewer behavior problems in the school and the kid is not bullied or whatever. But we as educators have to look at this closely because what we're essentially doing is going backwards. We're actually putting the kids back in the basement. We're isolating them again. So we have to always be looking at, well, what are the goals here? And if the goal is mastery of content, then probably um, pulling the kids out and putting them in the basement would work. Um, but the goals of educating kids with disabilities are much broader than that. And how are they going to learn 
to exist in the culture they're going to grow up into if they're essentially uh, in isolated conditions when they're learning in school. So these are complicated issues, and we're um, wrestling with uh, making sure that we measure the right things. And that's what I was talking about, that sort of like executive function. Um, and self-regulation. These are things kids really need to learn. And you're forced to learn them in face-to-face -face social environments with other kids. And if a, with a highly structured program, you're, you actually aren't forced to learn those things as strongly. So you may never learn them. So um, I hope that's clear. But thank you for bringing that up, Andy. Um, definitely autistic kids uh, are often thought of as be the kids who most do well in the online environment, both by vendors and schools. But I would, again, say, hmm, well at what? Uh, are we doing the right thing? Uh, OK. Um, and uh, this is just to kids, com to they persist, they complete, what are their outcomes? And um, here's actually that same issue. Um, I would say that the vendors believe that if they really knew, they think that kids with autism, for example, really persist and do well in their programs, as long as, again, the issues are content mastery. Um, but uh, again, it's very hard to tell, given the uh, sequestration of the data, so that we can't uh, answer the questions we'd really like to ask. Um, the primary barrier to research on these key variables is that we've just been talking about. Are they? What's the outcomes? Are they really getting the full outcomes that schooling is meant to do? Are they persisting and completing in these courses? Um, we need to know by what kind of disability, for example. What, what is the difference for autistic kids and kids with dyslexia? Um, and right now, it's very hard for us to study that, even with uh, support from the Department of Education. Um, so I have just a few minutes. I want to just complete with where we're going with our research, because we've learned that a whole lot of the ways we thought we'd do research are not going to work. Um, and that um, in many ways, we see the online system as having uh, a disconnection syndrome, which is here's the three main players. And um, there's the offline context I've talked about here that matters hugely. Oh, what's happening in the, um, the local environment really determines a lot of whether this is going to be successful or not. The online provider, what they make, how they provide it, how they supervise it, all of those things are huge factors. And then there's the individuals. The person have autism, does the person have social phobias, what is the uh, individual thing, and what's the parent's capabilities here? These three sort of uh, domains in the ecosystem are the determiners all uh, together in whether we could say it's working. Um, and they should be working together. Um, that would be the best thing, that parents really know what happens when their kid's online, and that uh, parents know what happens in their school at the same time. What's the school doing? And the school knows what happens when the kids are online. Oh, I got data back tonight of what happened to Billy. And oh, Billy kind of fell off the channel here. What happened to Billy? Why didn't he make any progress today? And schools should know that. And the online providers, they need to know, is Billy, what's going on in Billy's home context? What's going on in his school? Uh, like Alice's question, is he getting some instructional help on reading or not? It would be good if we knew that. Um, so these need to be working together. And uh, disconnection syndromes, I won't go, I'm a little bit too late to go into it, but the nervous system has disconnection syndromes, where the parts work fine, but they don't work together. And that's what's happening in our online world. The parts may work together. The online provider may be doing a good job, but it's disconnected from two key sources, knowing about the individual and their parents, knowing about the, um, what's happening in the school, what extra services are being provided, what's, uh, what else is going on. Is that kid playing with kids? Um, that, uh, right now, these are disconnected parts. Um, and the center is conducting its research moving forward largely by working with all three of these entities at the same time in what we're calling research to practice partnerships. And they have advantages, which are here, which I'm going to skip. Um, but by not being connected, there's two kinds of disabilities. Internally, the system 
actually can't monitor its own progress. It's hard to know, just like I've said, whether well, the kids are doing well or what, uh, for what reason are they doing poorly even. It's hard to tell. Maybe it's just because they're not getting something in the offline world that they need. Maybe it's because the online provider is providing something that's completely inaccessible. Maybe it's because the parent has disappeared when they should be there or whatever. But internally, we can't tell because the information's, there's data but no information. And externally, researchers like us can't really understand uh, the parts without um, looking at it in this holistic way. Um, so I'm going to give an example and then I'll end of, of how it feels disconnected. Um, audio supported reading, I think a lot of people are familiar with that. Having um, a lot of these environments have a lot of text in them. It's guaranteed that's going to be problematic for a lot of kids with disabilities. So most kids with disabilities face kind of this text barrier. And we really don't know very much about when and how audio supported, that is letting kids use text-to-speech engines, and there's fairly sophisticated ones now, you know, we need to know when should they use it, when should they not use it, all those sorts of things. And um, so we want to study that. But uh, let me just show you how it works. The provider, in this case, that we're going to work with, actually knows every time a kid clicks on a word and gets it read out loud. Every word, they know how fast they said it, they know when they did it, they know if they did it at home or school, they have great data. Um, they can record every time a kid uses it, which would be great. Great way to start our research. But they don't have access to the data on who the kid is. They know it's kid number 1473. They don't know who they are, what their disability is, what's happening in their home, or anything like that. Whether they're poor, rich, anything like that. So that limits how much they can know or do. And um, they don't have data about the school that would say, what is this? Did, like in some cases, the teachers say, no, no, don't use that. And we, we, we watch that. The teachers say, no, you don't turn on that text-to-speech. But the provider doesn't know it's because the teacher told the kid not to or because the kid doesn't want to. You know, what's going on? So you have this disconnect. That that's what disconnection looks like. So what we're doing is working with all three of these things together um, to do our research so we can really start to understand, is it something in the context that made the big difference? Is it something the provider's doing that made the big difference? But mostly it's going to be their interaction, just like everything else in a life. So we're reimagining our research going in that direction, which is reducing the barriers between these functional parts and getting them to be able to communicate well and using that as a test bed for the last point I'll make, which is, well, what are the policies and procedures that would allow these parts to talk together? Right now, they can't. Sometimes it's technical, a lot of times it's policy. So we want to actually work in local implementations like this to change policies and uh, technology practices so that the parts talk together and so that we can do our research and that the school can get better, the our online provider can get better, and individual kids can get better. So our research is going to look like that over the future, always with these at least three components in a partnership. And I think we'll be able to get um, uh, more progress and learn a lot about uh, how kids with disabilities can do in an optimally connected environment. OK, I finished uh, all I needed to say. Uh, right on time, Tracy. Um, yes, it is, David, and you've done really a, such an outstanding job of identifying not only the challenges that are facing all of us working with students with special needs, uh, but also the great opportunities that are out there. Uh, we, we did have a, a quite a robust discussion, but we're now at 4 o'clock. So uh, what we will do is make sure that these comments are posted online as part of this discussion. And uh, hopefully, David, we can entice you to come back and to uh, continue this very rich and interesting discussion. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you for setting it up, uh, Tracy. And um, I, I think I probably had a slide that says uh, we have some nice uh, Oh, good. You got some next steps here, Tracy. But um, if anybody knows a good partnership site where you know there's a school district that is really interested in doing better with kids with disabilities and they have a vendor, 
which is uh, a promising vendor um, and uh, that we could work with as a to make a research partnership uh, contact us we'd like to get uh, you know probably one or two more uh, so we can do these kinds of studies that's great well thank you uh, David can't uh, say enough about how informative this was and how important the work is that you're doing, uh, particularly as we find ourselves seeing online learning being rolled out with really very little information about for whom is this working under what uh, environment and what are the supports that students need to be successful. So take care, everyone. Hope to see you again online, and thank you all. Take care. Thanks, David. Bye-bye. Uh, we have bye -bye. a short survey.